Hi, my name is Elora Lopez and I'm a biology PhD candidate at Stanford University in Steve Palumbi's lab. Today I'm going to tell you about asexual and sexual mutation inheritance in clonal coral colonies. Today I want to tell you about my studies on mosaicism. Mosaicism is a phenomenon in which the cells of a multicellular organism are not all the same genotype. This may sound strange at first, but it's actually incredibly common because mosaicism results from mutations that occur over the lifespan of multicellular organisms. We're most used to thinking about somatic mosaicism. Somatic mosaicism results from somatic mutations, which are mutations that occur in non-gamete producing cells. Somatic mutations can lead to phenomena such as cancer, senescence, and less often talked about, but really interestingly, can also lead to advantageous traits, such as in this eucalyptus tree, where a somatic mutation that arose in a single branch led to leaves in the tree that were actually chemically different from the non-mutant leaves, and therefore were able to resist predation by insects. But my driving interest about mosaicism comes from the question of whether mosaicism can actually affect the next generation. That is, whether the mutations that accumulate in an organism may be inherited by their offspring. For most animals, the clear answer is no. And the reason for that is that most animals sequester their germlines during embryogenesis. By that, I mean that during embryogenesis, embryonic cells very early on uh, get sequestered or differentiated into either germ cells, which will later lead to gamete production, or they get differentiated into ectoderm, endoderm, mesoderm, which will eventually produce somatic cells. It's really important to note here that somatic cells, in this case, will never produce gametes. Germ cells will never become somatic cells. So this has been really well established in most animals for quite some time. But more recently, it's been shown that this is not the only mechanism of cell differentiation in animals. So in the model Nidarian hydractinia, it's been shown that there are these eye cells, which are stem cells that proliferate throughout adult life and can differentiate into either germ cells or somatic cells throughout adult life, not just during embryogenesis. This was really interesting to me because I'm used to thinking about mosaicism. And I wonder about how mosaicism within eye cells may lead to somatic mosaicism that's actually shared by the gametes of an organism if they share an eye cell mutant progenitor. The reason I'm interested in this is that I study reef building coral colonies, which are large and long lived. And it's been for many decades controversial whether or not they sequester germlines early in embryogenesis or not. Somatic mosaicism is really interesting for a whole bunch of different reasons, but for these coral colonies in particular, corals are threatened globally. And people who are studying these threatened animals are trying to understand their genetic diversity and the reservoirs of genetic diversity in their gametes when thinking about conservation planning for the future. So when I talk about these organisms, I'm talking about them being clonal and being colonial. By that, I mean that each of these colonies is made up of clones called polyps, which is what you're looking at here. So each polyp has its own mouth, its own tentacles, it's multicellular. And the growth of the colony occurs through division of these polyps. So a single polyp will divide into two. Those are clones of each other. That's how the colony grows. But in addition to that, each of these polyps is capable of sexually reproducing. It can produce its own gametes, its own eggs and sperm. So previously in my PhD work, my advisor and I were able to show that somatic mutations and somatic mosaicism exists in these animals. 
we showed a couple of different interesting things about the rates and patterns of those somatic mutations. And that was all well and good because we could show that we can detect this mosaicism. But the things that we weren't able to do in that paper are ask the question of, are the mosaic mutations found in the adult polyps also present in the sperm? And if they are present in the sperm, then how many mutations in the sperm come from inherited mosaicism as opposed to germline mutations? So in order to do this, I formed a really wonderful collaboration with Rebecca Albright, who is a curator at the California Academy of Sciences. And she and her team have created an incredible experimental system in which they're able to take coral colonies that are fertile from the field in Palau and bring them to San Francisco and have them spawn in the lab. So you can see here that they're packing up their corals, bringing them to the lab in San Francisco. And the lab is then able to get the coral colonies to spawn, which is incredibly difficult. But what you see here are adult coral colonies releasing bundles of eggs and sperm into the water column. And those eggs and sperm will then fertilize in the water and create new coral larvae. This is an incredible feat of engineering and biological expertise that makes this experimental system incredibly rare and incredibly valuable. So with this experimental setup, we were able to track not only mutations in the adult polyps, but also mutations in the sperm produced by those adults. So the way we did this, the great thing about corals is that about 20 minutes before they're about to release their gametes, you can tell that they're about to do it. Uh, because you can see their little tentacles holding their gametes in their mouths. And so about 20 minutes before spawning, Rebecca and I were able to break off individual branches from a couple of different coral colonies and place them into their own individual little cups of water. About 20 minutes later, those corals released their sperm into the water and we were able to collect that sperm and we know that that sperm came from that particular parent branch and only that parent branch. Then I constructed two replicate genome libraries for each DNA extraction. So from each parent branch, I extracted genomic DNA. And then from each DNA extraction, I created two technical replicate libraries. This is really crucial because the somatic mutations that we're looking at are incredibly rare, rarer than PCR or sequencing error rates. And so we've been able to show that by having technical replicates for each genome library, we can reduce our false positive rate by 70 to 80% just with that before adding any of our other filters. We did the same process for each of the sperm. So for each sperm DNA extraction, we had two replicate libraries to confirm true mutations. So we sequenced full genome libraries for 10 parent branches and 10 sperm pools that came from each of those branches. These came from three different coral colonies. So three parent branches from two of the colonies and four parent branches with associated sperm from the third colony. We sequenced to about 31x coverage per library for each of the parent libraries and about 48x coverage for each of the sperm libraries. We then had to define the mutations that we were interested in looking at. So we start with non-inherited somatic mutations. We called a mutation a somatic mutation if a single parent branch had a genotype that was different from the other parent branches from the same colony. We called that somatic mutation not inherited if the sperm that came from that parent branch did not match the mutant genotype and instead matched the non-mutant genotypes. We called a somatic mutation inherited if the mutant parent produced sperm that had the same mutation as its parent. So for most animals, we would say that somatic mutations never get inherited. But in this case, we actually see that some somatic mutations are inherited. 
So for each of our colonies, the majority of mutations were not inherited, but for all of them, some were inherited and the proportions are really variable. And the proportions of somatic mutations inherited by the sperm are variable, not just between colonies, but within branches of the same colonies as well. Next, we wanted to do a sanity check because there was a possibility that instead of looking at inherited somatic mutations, what we were actually looking at was a parent sample that was a heterogeneous mix of both soma and germline. And that because I just did batch tissue extraction, I was actually looking at a mix of both germline and soma and then thinking that these were inherited somatic mutations because we saw them sometimes in the parent and then they were also showing up in the sperm because we had sequenced some of the germline in the parent. We believe that this is not actually the case. And the reason for that is that when we plot the variant allele frequency and the variant allele frequency is the number of reads at a particular site with a given mutation divided by the total number of reads at that site. When we look at that frequency in the mutant parent compared to the mutant sperm, we find that they're pretty well correlated with each other and the slope of the line is less than a one-to-one -one line. The reason that this is important is because if corals actually did have a sequestered germline, we might expect to see things that we were accidentally calling somatic mutations if in my parent DNA I had both germline and somatic tissue. But I believe that this is not the case because if that were happening, then we would see sperm allele frequencies that were much higher than the parent because the parent would be heterogeneous for that mutation, whereas the sperm would just have that germline mutation or be much higher or 50-50 for it. So we believe that this supports the idea that these actually are somatic mutations that have been inherited. And then we we're also interested in, in looking at what we might call true germline mutations. So those are mutations that were never seen in the parents. And for unique germline mutations, we're seen in only one sperm pool. But for global germline mutations, we're seen in all sperm pools and never in the parents. So when we look at all four of these types of mutations together, we find that inherited mosaic mutations account for a non-trivial number of the mutations in the sperm. That is, the inherited mosaic, the unique germline, and the global germline represent all of the mutations in the sperm from a particular colony. And while, again, those proportions are quite variable from colony to colony and indeed from branch to branch, we see inherited mosaic and unique germline mutations in every single branch of the colony for all three colonies. So we believe that this data supports the hypothesis that adult corals can generate germ and somatic cells from stem cells. The reasoning is this. If corals were like most animals, then we would expect to see germline mutations, and we would expect to see mutations in the soma that were not inherited. But we don't just see that. We don't just see germline mutations, and we don't just see not inherited somatic mutations. We also see mutations that appear in the soma as well as the gametes, the things that we were calling inherited somatic mutations. And here I would argue that they're probably not actually inherited somatic mutations, but they're inherited eye cell mutations in which a mutant eye cell gave rise to both germ cells that produce gametes as well as somatic mosaics. Uh, I'll just finally say that we're exploring many different features of this data set that I didn't have a chance to talk about here, um, including all sorts of different types of mutations uh, that we see as well as selection on these mutations and relative rates. And anyone who wants to get in contact with me about this is more than welcome to do so. So at this point, I want to say thank you to everyone for listening. Thank you to my collaborators. And thank you for the Society of Molecular Biology and Evolution for hosting these talks online.